Welcome to the Good Shepherd in the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child through the method of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. A few months ago, we shared a survey for our listeners to fill out to give us an idea of who was listening and what their interests were. One of those questions was asking for suggestions on ideas for topics that you would like to listen to. Many, many people responded with the same answer, that they were interested in hearing more about freedom and discipline in the atrium. So today, I have Claire Paglia with us, who is Montessori trained and a catechist in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, and she is speaking into what is freedom and discipline and how to apply it both in our atria, but also at home and in our lives. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. Claire, we're so excited that you were here with us. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Claire, would you tell us a little bit about who you are and also your involvement with both Montessori and Catechesis of the Good Shepherd? Sure. So I am a child of the atrium. I started in level one at age four and a half when it began at my church and grew with each level as as we added them um, through level three. And I'm Montessori trained, so I've also spent time assisting at the AMI Training Center um, a few years ago, and then also being in my own primary environment for the last 12 years. And I was really drawn to Montessori, realizing that it meets the child where they are developmentally, just as we know, catechesis does the same thing for the child spiritually. Mm. I received my level one formation in 2012 when my oldest was a baby, and I have been a catechist since then in varying capacities at our church. Currently, I am working from home and homeschooling my children. My three children are nine, five, and one, and I really have been continually drawing on my time in the atrium, what I remember from my time in the atrium as a child, and really trying to listen for that still small voice. Mm. I think it is really beautiful and a huge blessing that you experienced Good Shepherd as a child, and now you've come full circle, and now you're an adult in the atrium, seeing it through your own children's eyes. Yes, it's a gift for sure. Do you have any specific memories that maybe are strong from when you were a child in the atrium? I just remember the really loving the pace. It was so different than my school. Um, my parents discovered Montessori when my I, I'm the oldest, so my when my younger brother and sister were were ready for school, and so I didn't do Montessori as a child. But I loved just the feeling of the atrium. Like I remember just feeling it. It just felt like a retreat, and mm-hmm. um, and and just the time to be able to work on things without somebody saying, "Oh, now we have to go to the next thing." Oh, now mm-hmm. we have to go to the next thing. Mm-hmm. And then the other big one is just really remembering how much I loved planning the prayer <laughs> services. Mm-hmm. In level three, I think I loved being able to take, you know, that clipboard around and figure out, okay, who's going to sing what song, who's going to say what prayer, you know. So it was fun to be able to to coordinate those things. So it's definitely something that I fall back on. That's awesome. I love that you said one. The main thing that you remember is your the feeling that you had because um, that's something that I always talk about that with children in the church or the relationship with God, they're not going to remember the facts as much as they're going to remember how they felt. Mm -hmm. And if children feel loved or if children feel welcomed, if children have a positive emotion um, associated with God or with the church or with a certain sacrament, that is, I think, what they are going to remember the most rather than the facts that we're trying to put in their head. Yes, definitely. Well, that's that's really that's really neat that you were able to experience this work from such a young age. Well, you and I are going to be diving into a really big topic. I am I'm really excited about this topic, but I'm also a little nervous because I feel like this is such an important topic. We've had a lot of people request the topic of freedom and discipline, um, and I know in my own work, both as a catechist with Catechism Good Shepherd, but then also when I was coordinating that this issue of um, how to apply freedom and discipline in the atrium was a consistent issue. Um, I think all of us who have gone through formation experience this beautiful, peaceful presentations and time in the atrium, and then you throw 13, three to six-year-olds in there, and it doesn't look the same as in formation if you're going, wait, 
is, am I doing it wrong? I'm not, obviously I'm not doing it like the formation leader then. And so these issues of freedom and discipline come up and how to respect the child, give them the freedom, but also have discipline in the atrium. So I'm really excited to have you here, Claire, for you to share your Montessori and Good Shepherd experience with us and how we can apply this beautiful concept into our lives with any of the children that we have in our lives. Absolutely. Well, let's start off with defining it. What does this mean? What does freedom and discipline mean? So I really want to start by saying that freedom and discipline are frequently misunderstood. And I love what you touched on because I feel that in our formation as catechists and also in the training, the Montessori training, there's so much emphasis on what you're going to be doing in the atrium and the ideal of what you're hoping to get to. And so I think that um, it's important to continue to keep this mindset that we're all learning we're all still growing and there's not necessarily like a point of arrival where you can all of a sudden you have all of the information and it's going to run smooth sailing mm-hmm. you know, forever. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. There's always that shift of the dynamic of the children in the environment and the adults that you're working with. And so there's all those little pieces that work together. Um, but I think if to define it though, um, to really look at what freedom means and what discipline means in this context Montessori really talked about that freedom is the psychological state that one reaches or attains. So for example, she thinks about or talks about that concentration is the result of freedom, which I think is really interesting. And and also being able to accept rules without being limited by them. The purposeful work that we offer in our environments that leads to concentration and then is followed by the opportunity to make choices and then subsequently develop the will, feeds independence, and results in freedom. So that's kind of the idea of of what she's talking about with freedom. And discipline is a little bit more complicated. I find that in our culture, we feel like discipline is really the act of trying to shape someone else or change the way that they're behaving. And when I was looking back at Montessori's work, she's really referring to not discipline in the the thought of this practice of training people to obey rules, but really to look at Mm self-discipline. So the ability to control one's feelings and overcome one's weaknesses and the ability to pursue what you think is right you know, doing it because you know it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So Maria Montessori said in the discovery of the child that we claim that an individual is self-disciplined when he or she is the master of himself or herself when he or she can, and as a consequence, control himself or herself when he must follow a rule of life. Mm -hmm. So really just kind of shifting that thought of that it's really developing self-discipline. That's really what we're looking for. And in the Montessori environment and in in the atrium too, we we really think about this concept of freedom within limits rather than, you know, that's what I I continue to say to myself instead of freedom and discipline. So it's Mm. a, it's a, it's a work in progress. The concept of freedom and discipline has always been something that I'm drawn to, but I've also had the idea of like, okay, that's great, but how does it actually work? <laughs> like, yes. that's, like the definition, everything you just described sounds really great. And I know it exists because I've seen it, especially in Montessori classrooms whenever I've done observation, but how do I make it happen? So how does it actually, how do I create freedom and discipline in my space? Mm-hmm. So I think that the first thing to really look at, and it's a lot to kind of wrap your mind around, but just really thinking about the role of the adult and -hmm. really looking at the adult as being the dynamic link between the child and the environment. Um, On one of my theory papers, I had made this little triangle, and I'm certain that my trainer did it during during our Montessori training, but Mm -hmm. each, each angle of the triangle, one had one part had the child, another part had the adult, and then the third said the environment. So it all is interconnected and interwoven. And so there are definitely things that we can do as the adult to help create and cultivate an environment that is rich for growth. So being that dynamic link, it's really our work 
to ensure that the environment is prepared and stocked and ready for the child, and to know that we are ready also spiritually when we come into the environment. In the Montessori training, my trainer would frequently say, you need to leave leave all the extra things at the door. And I was in, in the longer I'm in this work, the harder that is. It's mm-hmm. really challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, but we really try to think about the child and the environment is like a plant in, in the greenhouse. So vital and successful growth really comes from taking a preventative approach and determining what are the ideal conditions for that child to mm-hmm. flourish and, and develop. So there are things that you can do as the group, but then we're also looking individually. How can we make this the most successful experience for Mm -hmm. the child? And and really in the atrium, a a space where the child can meet the Holy Spirit and and be attuned to what's going on without too much added distraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like on a more basic level, making sure that the atrium has order because it's hard for or maybe not just each in the classroom or your home or mm-hmm. so that the child can have peace and order within themselves. And then on a deeper level, uh, like checking yourself at the door, like what you're talking about, I believe um, in listening to God with children, Gianna Gobi, she speaks about, actually, I think she's referring to what Dr. Montessori speaks about that as catechists, we have to go through like an examination of conscience before we yes. enter into the atrium with the children And I can tell you from my own experience that if I feel rushed or if I'm overwhelmed or if I'm having a bad day, if I'm not careful, it can really affect the children in the atrium. Um, So there's that examination of conscience that they're talking about that we, we have to leave it at the door. And I think, I think we can all relate to that in anything in our lives. Whenever we're feeling stressed, we interpret the people around us differently. So if I'm having a rushed or stressed day, it might affect the way I think the child is acting yes. or the child's intention. So there's that, again, that need for that examination of conscience. Yes. And really this, this conscious, conscious work of reframing and really trying to separate the behavior and try to look underneath, like what, what is really going on underneath this behavior mm-hmm. and how can we figure out how to get ahead of it? How can we, there's a lot of different ways to to look at that. You know, I think that it's it's easy to leave, you know, especially when I left Montessori training, I, I felt like, okay, I'm going to observe and I'm going to sit back and watch and, and the, all of this is going to unfold and it's going to be amazing. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and like you were saying, once you're in the environment, it's really, um, it's a much more active role than than we think, but it's mm-hmm. different than, than that traditional mindset. So we really want to try to figure out how to remove obstacles and, and guide without hindering the child and, and doing that through offering choices and being gentle yet firm. Mm-hmm. And I think it's possible to be clear and consistent in that capacity as well. So to have the environment set up, but then also to have myself set up and to then observe the child, to have that beautiful um, art of observation, that constantly observing the child, that is the almost active participation that you're speaking Mm -hmm. about, um, to observe the child, but it's something deeper underneath that might be happening within them. Maybe their behavior is because something's going on with them inside of their little hearts or um, they're tired, or they're hungry, or they're stressed, or they're not feeling loved at that moment for whatever reason, or um, the the child is is saying something different through the behavior that they are exhibiting. Yes. Mm. Well, Claire, how about we kind of think about some instances that either of us have experienced, um, and you can speak into how we might be able to apply freedom and discipline into those those situations. Sure. That sounds great. Um, The first thing that comes to mind for me, I have a child that has been in my level one atrium who he's the sweetest little thing, but at times he will choose materials and he will very intentionally not use the materials the way he knows he's supposed to. And he's looking at me to see if I'm watching and he smiles at me and he continues to, um, it's very much playing, not working that he's doing with the materials. So as a Montessori and from the, from the perspective of freedom and discipline, how would I approach this situation? 
So I think it sounds like you've been observing this child <laughs> for sure, because that's usually the first thing I go to is observing and trying to figure out a pattern. You know, is this is this child playing with the material? You know, in in the Montessori environment, they can have a snack whenever they're hungry, and so sometimes the work quality devolves when they're starting to need to get a snack of some kind. But you know that that's not really relevant in the atrium. So really, just thinking about what is the child doing with the materials? You know, if they're actively playing with them, there's no synthesizing happening. There's no, you know, there was a child, you made me think of that was in my atrium a few years ago, and she would every Sunday without fail collect all of the baby Jesuses from all of the infancy narratives and she would hold them and she and I could not figure out what she was doing and she wasn't really playing she just wanted to hold them and then one Sunday I look over and she's arranged them in the sheet fold and I and so then I was like you know what if I had jumped in here and and said oh no we can't hold them you know let's you know, I was just trying to figure out what was going on. So for that child, she obviously wasn't, she wasn't playing like mommy baby house kind of thing. She was really, she's working something out. Um, but if the intention and in, if the child is actively distracting other children, that's really when we need to intervene. Mm-hmm. And, and in, you know, I've experienced this in, in my environment too. And sometimes I'll come and I'll just sit with the child as they're not using the material the way that they're really supposed to and and just try to see what what's going on and then sometimes I'll offer I'll say may I show you how to use those again and and they'll sometimes they'll say yes and sometimes they'll be like well I'm actually done and then put it all away <laughs> um <laughs> and and sometimes it's a sign to me that this child really needs deeper work they need more you know they might need a new presentation on a material. They might need the next moment of a material. Um, They're really trying to let you know without letting you know, but yet they're looking at you. So they're (laughs) letting Mm -hmm. you know um, Mm -hmm. that they're ready for something more. And, And I would really be curious with that child in particular, like, you know, is this child someone that comes in easily to the environment? You know, there's, there's so many different things that kind of go into figuring out what can be behind it. But I do think that Obviously, if a child is misusing a material, if they're damaging the material, or if they're actively distracting someone else, I intervene immediately. So if they are being disruptive or they're being destructive, that is when you intervene. Other than that, you try to observe to the best of your ability to see what's going on deeper. Mm-hmm. And and mm-hmm. honestly, I've I've definitely also had children that will start to mix materials from different, and especially with the infancy narrative, starting to mix, you know, all of, and, and more often than not, I've gone up and said, oh, these materials belong with this and these belong with this. However, I take a moment to observe to see if they're actually, like, are they synthesizing all of that work together or are they Mm -hmm. just playing house, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I once had children um, connect, our last supper and our good shepherd were very close to each other. And they were starting to make a line of the sheep and then it led over to the the Last Supper mm. and then had the sheep all around the Last Supper table. And it was the Eucharistic present presentation that they'd gotten to all by themselves. It was really beautiful. That's but there's amazing. that combining of work. And it took me just watching them to make sure that there was actually like contemplating. And it, it correct me if I'm wrong. I, Maria Montessori talked about it's the disposition of the child that might help you know if you should intervene. So if the child seems to be like deep in their work and more calm in their presence, they're more normalized. You can see that they are not playing, but they're actually working. Yes. Often, often the playing is a bit more active and, (laughs) and, and does distract those around. So, so yes. And in, in my training for Montessori, my trainer would speak of thinking about, you know, you intervene when something is distracting damaging to the material or dangerous to oneself or others. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of keep in mind this idea of stand back, not yet, wait and see. So you're really, Mm -hmm. you're looking at just surveying before you intervene. Um, Because I think sometimes we tend to jump in too quick, but then there's also that dance of waiting too long. So it's just trying to make sure that you're still maintaining those consistent expectations and limits 
mm-hmm. you know, and, and gentle firmness along with that. Mm-hmm. Well, what about a child who is trying to be disruptive, maybe running from one end of the atrium to the other, being very loud, singing, um, intentionally trying to bother the other children for attention or for whatever reason? How would you intervene or assess a situation like that? So I, I usually begin with that to really think about that behavior as communication and indicator mm-hmm. of a skill that really needs to be developed. So often it's not a won't, but a can't. So children really do well when they can. And that's that quote came from Ross Green, the children do well when they can. So with that in mind and really trying to figure out, separate the behavior from, you know, the behavior isn't who the child is. It's usually masking something else. And there's another quote that comes to mind that I feel like can match with this and then I'll dive into how I would handle it. Mm -hmm. But the other, this other quote is beneath every behavior, there is a feeling and beneath each feeling is a need. And when we meet that need, rather than focus on the behavior, we begin to deal with the cause, not the symptom. Mm -hmm. And that's from, her name is Ashley Warner. I believe she's a psychologist. So I've definitely experienced Every year I've had a handful of children that are actively um, just not settled and they're not connecting with the environment as much as I'm hoping or even connecting with me as much. So the first thing that I begin with is trying to build that relationship with the child. So whether it's greeting the children at the door and having a quick conversation before they come in, sometimes that can help settle. Mm. Sometimes at the beginning, well, at the beginning of every atrium year and, and the year in my Montessori environment, we always begin with the expectations of what we're hoping for. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's walking and then we practice walking together or, you know, and I know some of, so for the child that's still struggling after all of this groundwork has been laid to follow that, it really lets you know that they're could be something else going on. So sometimes that child really needs to stay close to the adult. In, in my Montessori environment, my assistant and I would call them pocket pals sometimes, not, not to them, obviously, but <laughs> we would talk about how they would just need to stay close, close enough to be able to touch your pocket if, you know, if need be. And, and that's the, the beauty of a Montessori environment in the atrium is that they can still gain so much by being able to observe and being with the adult if it's helping them to settle. I think sometimes a child that's really struggling to regulate in an environment in an enclosed space may need to just go for a walk if with the if there's an assistant that can take them for a walk or can do something that engages um you know there's I could go down quite a rabbit hole of <laughs> sensory <laughs> systems and like mm-hmm. all these different things that we can do. But sometimes children that are, are racing like that back and forth or, or disrupting others are really seeking proprioceptive input. So that's input that is deep pressure. And so in, in that sense, like they could do wall pushups or they could do, we had yoga in our environment um, and, that, and I intentionally chose poses that required you know, whether it was like uh, the cobra pose where they kind of go up and they're pushing against the ground or just something to give some of that input that helps to regulate mm-hmm. um, is, is helpful. And, and I think especially in the atrium, because the time is so limited, it's really helpful if you're noticing this to have a conversation with the parent and just mm-hmm. to say, is this something you see other places? This is what we're seeing here. Have you found anything that works? You know, often the parent might say, well, you know, my child's doing some additional, you know, is getting support somewhere else and here are some of the strategies. And so then they can, you guys can work together as a team to help the child be successful. Mm -hmm. And depending on your group size, you might want an additional assistant in certain situations just to be able to um, make sure that everybody in your group is, is managed and getting the attention. Yes. And I'm glad you said that because I think that that's another part of our role is to make sure that the environment is safe for everyone. And so sometimes that does involve having another adult come in. And a few years ago, I did have a a child that did need significant support. And so we had a 
someone come in who was also Montessori trained and she observed, she would sit in the observation chair and only get up as needed. So it wasn't another adult hovering. It was just someone that was there to try to get ahead of any kind of behavior that we might be seeing and, you know, notice the signs faster than, you know, when you're the lead catechist, there's a lot that you're doing at one time. And so sometimes you can't pick up on those little, you know, little triggers ahead of time. So if you have an additional adult that can help with that, that's really, really very helpful, but they really need to be able to be willing to observe and not intervene unless it's absolutely necessary. Yeah. Those are some really great suggestions. Love it. Um, I heard you say at towards the beginning about like the ways of the atrium or the ways of the classroom or even the ways of your home, like how to walk or how to talk or how to interrupt those sorts of things. I see those as being ways to help really set up freedom and discipline well. Um, yes. You have a really strong foundation in those ways of the atrium and the children know how to walk or talk in the atrium or what's expected of them. It allows them to have that freedom to know how they're to behave <clears throat> with the self-discipline of knowing what is expected of them. Absolutely. Setting up those those expectations ahead of time and then maintaining <laughs> clear and consistent mm -hmm. limits when it comes to those things. You know, if you see a child walk across a rug, you're, you would come to them and say, oh, rugs are for working or however you want to say it. But let's walk around it. Let's walk around it together. And then mm -hmm. so then you reset that limit. But it's not, you know, there's there's not an, a negative consequence. It's just let's, oh, let's remind you again. Let's, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's just a, a natural way that we handle it. Yeah, I think throughout every atrium year, I always say, um, I wonder if that's how we walk in the atrium. <laughs> I wonder if you remember how we walk in the atrium. Oh, and it triggers. Oh, yes. And then they do the very exaggerated slow walk after yes. that. <laughs> in that very slow walk before. <laughs> and, and sometimes they love being able to demonstrate that for others. You know, in those those brief grace, grace and courtesy lessons that we can offer sometimes, um, sometimes that part where they get to show how they can do that. Or, you know, the one that I love is doing the how to get the attention of someone that's across the room. You know, mm -hmm. we're not going to shout across the room, but showing a hand signal that you can use. And so they, they always love to, you know, act that out and mm -hmm. um, do that in a, a small group. Mm -hmm. Well, Claire, what about the child who is hard to engage into a work? Maybe they just flat out refuse to do a work mm -hmm. or maybe just kind of wander and um, don't have any interest in doing any work. So that's, it's important with that question to really look at the plane of development and, and kind of what is appropriate for that plane of development. Um, I think that for the younger children, sometimes they just want to sit back and watch what's going on before they dive in. And, and I always fall back on, there's a phrasing that I hear, I've heard repeatedly over the last few years, and it's finally clicked in a different way for me, but it's this idea of connecting and then redirecting. And that connection is so important before really expecting a child to, mm -hmm. you know, fully engage. Sometimes with the children that are hesitant, they need, they really want to feel like they have something important to do in the environment. So for sometimes for those children, I might say, oh my goodness, these plants are so dry would you like to help me water them? And then I might get a watering can and they might get a watering can. Or, um, you know, sometimes it depends obviously on the setup with the atria. If it's an older child that's having trouble settling or not having trouble, but just not engaging as much, sometimes, you know, bringing a little material or something to another atria, if that's not too distracting. I've done that um, in my Montessori environment before. And that was really helpful because then they were like, oh, I can, I can do a job. <laughs> this is exciting. <laughs> Um, but I think it's also really to remember that the child will reveal themselves to us in time. Montessori talked about that frequently and, and it's really our job to help just gently guide that child and not, there's no need to force them to work with a material or, you know, there's so much they can gain by just being in the environment. Mm -hmm. So uh, really allowing just the space for that. And that's the beauty of, of the atrium is really we do have the time and the space. There's not 
the necessary, that rush that you can feel other places. And the child might really be relishing in that. And so they just want to watch for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think your own testimony that your main memory of your time in the atrium was this feeling of peace and freedom. Child that might not be engaging in a work that might be what they're absorbing is peace and freedom. And that's Mm -hmm. what they're. And I think that there's value in that. Um, But, you know, I've also heard you say both in the last instance of the disruptive child and this one, who's like the non-engaged child, that you first said that we should connect with them. And um, it's like building a rapport, building a relationship with them, like that should be the primary focus before we move on to the behavior or to inviting them into work. And I feel like that is such a universal need. Um, that everybody, all of us, children, adults, every human being desires to be seen and heard and wanted and loved. And, and that's such a core, such a core need, but also such a core response to why we behave the way we do to where if we first connect with the person, I feel like that alone might change everything for the person. If they feel that they are loved or seen by you, they might be more willing to to listen to what you have to say or to be interested in what you are interested in or to be respectful or whatever it is um, because they are getting that core need of being seen and wanted and loved met by you taking the time to look them in the eyes, be at their level, connect with them, ask them about their day or whatever. But I, I just find that really unique and beautiful and necessary that you mentioned that in both of these instances. I, I completely agree with you that it's it's just so important. And um, I think the other thing to keep in mind, though, is if a child is still having a hard time, even after you're attempting to connect and you're able to kind of separate the behavior from the child, that it really could be that there's a skill that needs to be developed. It's not, you know, they're not trying to be, you know, vindictive or mm-hmm. spiteful or th- there really could be something else going on under the surface that they can't articulate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that might be the only way that they've learned um, how to deal with their confusion that's going on inside of them. Mm-hmm. Mm. What's really wonderful about all the different techniques that you have talked about is they can be applied in all different situations. I'm, I've been imagining this whole time in my home with my own children of like, um, you know, when my home has order, my children probably have more order <laughs> or uh, <laughs> examining my own consciousness before I address my children with issues that I feel like I need to address with them or, um, you know, connecting with them before I redirect them or correct connecting with them before I, I discipline them or discuss with them or have conversations with them. And I just, I, I love the way that these concepts that Montessori, that Maria Montessori has given us can be so universally applied. They're not limited to the classroom, to the atrium. They are, almost how we can be better human beings. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Well, Claire, this is a really huge topic and I feel like we've just barely scraped the surface, but um, I, we, I think we should do some follow-up episodes specifically on this because I just feel like there's so much here and there's a lot of growth that we all ha- need, to, need to have with this issue. But um, is there anything before we finish for today that you would like to speak about? I think the only other thing I wanted to add, which I think I touched on briefly earlier, but is really just thinking about the role that, you know, Dr. Montessori took and even um, Gianna and Sophia as well, that they really kind of, they were the careful observers. You know, Maria Montessori talked about being, taking the role of the scientist and, and having that guide the decisions that they make with each child. Um, and really trying to do our best to remove our preconceived notions and focus on the child in front of us and really Mm -hmm. let observation, genuine curiosity be our guide. It's, um, it's a work in progress. It takes time. And, you know, even, even with the amount of time that I've spent researching this topic, reading about this topic and in my work, there are still days (laughs) regularly, (laughs) um, Mm -hmm. to be completely candid with you know, with my family at home where I, you know, I don't respond the way that I want to, or, you know, and it's just, we're human and it's, it's, it's hard sometimes to, to work on it, to accept that in a sense, but mm-hmm. to really just continue to realize that this is a work in progress. All of us struggle with similar things. 
And, and it's just, uh, if we can shift our mindset to being that we're going to continue to grow, we're going to continue to learn Mm -hmm. and we're going to continue to, um, try to serve, especially in this capacity, serve the child to the best possible, um, in the best possible way is really what we're hoping for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what a beautiful example of humility it is to our children when we screw up. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, we, and we go to them and say, I screwed up. I'm really sorry. I should yes. not have said that. I shouldn't have said that to you. I shouldn't have um, yelled at you or whatever it is. Um, if we were perfect parents, I think that it would be, actually be harder for them in some ways. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think our, our, our mess ups really allow for mercy and grace and humility. Yes. <laughs> I've I, got a I lot agree. of of that going on. <laughs> yeah, I do too. <laughs> well, or, or do you have any resources that maybe if somebody wants to grow in this area that you would recommend to anybody? Well, I, um, I do have an Instagram page that I had started last summer to kind of just chronicle our life trying to do Montessori at home. Um, mm-hmm. and it's called at home with Montessori. However, you know, I, I share a lot on that page from other resources. So one of my favorite psychologists is, um, her name is Dr. Becky, but her website is Dr. Becky at home. And she does a lot with just really diving, deep diving into these topics that we've touched on and, and a lot of really practical advice for, for families, but I think it can also apply in the atrium setting and, and helping with that, just reframing and and shifting our mindset. The other one that I've really enjoyed is called Curious Parenting. And -hmm. they also have a website, but it's a very similar format. It's just in more easily digestible pieces. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think those are my two real favorites at the moment. But, you know, I'm always gathering more and more resources for for this topic because it's it's a big one. Yeah, it's and it's an important one. Well, thank you so much, Claire. Thank you very much for sharing all of your time and wisdom with us. I really appreciate you. Thank you for having me. It's been it's been a blessing to be able to be a part of this. Thank you all for listening to this episode with me and Claire. We have a lot of resources that we want to share with you. So look in the show notes because there are a lot of links as well as chapter suggestions in different Montessori books such as the Absorbent Mind and Discovery of the Child, etc. We give you specific chapters that you can read from those books to read more about freedom and discipline. We also spoke briefly about the book Listening to God with Children, so I put a link to that book as well in our show notes. Claire and I would like to speak about this topic some more, but we really would like your input into what specifically you have questions about regarding freedom and discipline. So go to our Facebook page, the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, and look for a thread that we are going to be starting today on the day we air, February 3rd, 2021, about freedom and discipline and comment with some questions or scenarios that you would like some input or insight into. And then Claire and I can discuss some of those on a future podcast episode. Back in June, we had Elizabeth Calanchini on the podcast to speak about the infant toddler in regards to catechesis of the Good Shepherd. So I really wanted to let everybody know about an opportunity that is coming up. From Sunday, April 18th, 2021 to Sunday, April 25th, 2021, In Scottsdale, Arizona, we will be hosting a seminal infant toddler catechesis formation. So if you would like more information about that or to register for this formation, look in our show notes. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. We would like to thank all our contributing members for making this podcast possible. If you would like to know more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, or if you would like to become a member, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for listening this week. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.